Okay, uh, good evening. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Paul Dillon, uh, Chair of the uh, Mechanical and uh, Manufacturing Division of Engineers Ireland. Um, a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Uh, exits at the back, and uh, sorry, at the back and at the uh, back of the lecture theatre on the at the uh, entry door where we came in. If you can keep uh, questions to the end, uh, we'll have a discussion hopefully at the end, and then we'll ha hold on to the questions till then. Um, if uh, people who are online, you can actually send your questions there to that uh, Gmail account, and uh, we'll uh, kind of hopefully collect them at the end and uh, have them at the panel discussion. Um, I'll hand over to my uh, treasurer of the actual committee, uh, Mr. Connor Sheehan, who will introduce our um, speakers for this evening. The topic for this evening's talk was prompted by feedback we got from previous talks where participants have requested more information on the Irish academic research structure, and more important, how to access it. Our four speakers this evening are perfectly positioned and very well qualified to answer those questions. Uh, Barry Kennedy, the CEO of ICMR, the Irish Centre for Manufacturing Research. We'll give a quick introduction to the Technology Centre programme. This is a joint initiative between Enterprise Ireland and the IDA before it talks about the ICMR in more detail. Darren Morrissey, Director of Programmes in Science Foundation Ireland, will talk about the SFI um, enterprise focused programmes. Sean Lyons, Gateway Manager of the Applied Polymer Technologies, APT, will give a quick overview of the Technology Gateway programme before concentrating on his own centre. And finally, my colleague Barry Fennell, Programme Manager of Knowledge Transfer Ireland, will talk about how KTI can help industry to access the best knowledge and the most appropriate knowledge from across the state. So with that introduction, I'll hand over to Barry Kennedy. Thanks, Connor. Good evening, everybody. On the 14th of August last um, I guess I was hit with some news that uh, kind of rocked my world. Um, I was at a hospital. I had been uh, had an operation on my tongue for uh, a small growth that had appeared. Um, it was 8 o'clock in the morning and the phone rang downstairs. It was from the consultant to say the news wasn't good that I had got cancer of the tongue. It's a kind of shocking news for any of us to receive. Um, to have to deal with and cope with, I guess, telling the family about the fact that you've now got cancer and that we weren't too sure at the time what the outcome was going to be uh, moving forward. Um, I was taken into hospital the following day uh, for further surgery, of which a quarter of my tongue was removed, and um, a neck dissection took place to take out um, some glands out of my neck to stop the cancer spreading. So as you can imagine, the family was in great shock. Uh, my uh, mum and dad were in, were very worried. My wife was in, very worried. And um, my brothers and family, to be fair, were very worried as well. Uh, they came in to see me in hospital. And one of my brothers walked into the room, and he is the wannabe engineer. And as you can imagine, in a family setting like this, there was a little bit of tension, and everybody's a little bit upset about the whole thing. Um, I came to the side of my bed, and he gave me a gift, which I opened. And inside that box, I found the tongue from a pair of Doc Martens, which he had brought in to me and gave me as a gift while I was in hospital to cheer me up. He said, I figured you, could ne you needed that. I thought as engineers, you'd appreciate uh, that particular story because uh, that's what we do as actually as engineers. We, we look actually at, at things that exist in other parts of the world, maybe in science or physics, we take those things and we try to apply them I into new fields of use. And so my brother did his bit anyway to try and do that on that day, but of course the whole idea was just to cheer me up. Um, I'm uh, Barry Kennedy, I'm CEO of um, Irish Centre for Manufacturing Research, but actually I'm CEO of a, of an umbrella or a number of companies actually under the banner, which I'm delighted actually to talk about today for the first time, a banner uh, under a banner called Advanced Manufacturing Ireland. In Advanced Manufacturing Ireland, uh, as an umbrella organisation, is representing three different separate uh, research uh, companies. 
Uh, the centre piece of it is Irish Manufacturing Research, which is a government-funded initiative, which I'll talk through in a few moments. And left and right of that is I2E2 um, and ICMR. I2E2 and ICMR are industrial networks. Um, I2E2 is focused in the area of energy efficiency, and ICMR is actually focused in the area of manufacturing productivity. These two network organisations, which are made up of primarily uh, companies, big and small, indigenous and multinational, um, focus on looking at the areas of research that we should focus on jointly together to solve manufacturing problems, make ourselves more energy efficient, make ourselves more, um, more uh, productive. And this, these organisations are responsible now for feeding that information into the Irish Manufacturing Research Organisation, which is primarily a state-funded um, organisation. The whole focus of this umbrella organisation is to enable Ireland as a global leader in advanced manufacturing. So where did this come from? In 2009, a number of companies got together. Um, things weren't too good in the country, and we thought it would be a good idea, or there was an opportunity for Ireland to leverage one of its asset bases that it has, that it hadn't really fundamentally recognised, um, in terms of the amount of investment that we had in, in Ireland. Um, when you look at Ireland and, and compare it to Brazil, Russia, India, and China, um, between the years of 1990 and 2011, um, the investment into Ireland has been 189 billion versus 159 billion into BRIC countries uh, combined. That's a significant investment into Ireland. It's a significant manufacturing asset base. And it was an asset base that we figured as clusters of companies that if we could figure a way to work together with one another, we could do some fantastic joint research together. So that started us on our journey as a group of companies. Why would we have done that? Well, at the time, we were concerned about the fact that these manufacturing companies might decide to leave the country. And if they did decide to leave the country, what else would, would leave with it? So I'm just going to share with you here uh, the television story, um, for those of you who, who don't know it. But the early inventors of the TV uh, were around in 1930. Um, there was eight Americans, one French, one British, one Hungarian, one German, one Russian, and one Japanese person that's been accredited with the invention of the TV set. 1939 until today, there's been over 220 TV set manufacturers worldwide. Manufacturing of uh, TV sets today are taking place in India, China, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. It's a multi-billion dollar business, and the question is, where is the wealth and the knowledge now? And I think this is something that um, co countries in Europe are really stepping up and recognising. Um, if you look in the UK, they had lost their manufacturing base. And with that, they have lost an awful lot of knowledge and know-how and service businesses and everything else that goes with that. So there's a real recognition that actually in the manufacturing uh, industries are, are a foundation and a rock that's important for any economy. And so with that in mind, this group of companies, when we got together to form this research centre, we said, OK, let's all get together and see what we can do to try and generate IP and knowledge and know-how. That would give another reason why, if you're a multinational, you'd want to stay in Ireland, or if you're an indigenous company, that would help you get lift so that you could get your products maybe out into a bigger uh, international market. I2E2, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's uh, focused on the energy and energy network. Um, the, the mission of that organisation is to sustain and grow a unique cross-sector industry network that develops Ireland into a global industrial energy efficiency leader. And it has a number of strategic objectives, uh, networking, manufacturing, research, education, and influencing, influencing uh, national energy efficiency uh, priorities or policies. If you look at ICMR, the network, it's, it's focused on becoming a global leader in advanced manufacturing, or positioning Ireland, should I say, as a global leader in advanced manufacturing. Um, its strategic objectives are uh, something similar to I2E2, in that it, it's a network organisation looking at the area of manufacturing, research and education also. Moving on to the research centre itself, um, it is the area, it is the organisation that's doing the actual research on the ground. Um, it does it in its, in its lab-based environment with a view to taking the products that it's developing out of the research environment fast and putting it into the manufacturing floor and doing large-scale industrial pilots with the manufacturing companies that are involved in the two network organisations. The strategy is to develop a manufacturing and energy efficiency research programme to create and disseminate knowledge and deliver significant benefits to industry. The members uh, that are involved, here's just a list of, the, of our Tier 1 um, uh, companies that are involved in terms of doing research with the centre, you can see them there, and, and the list of the number of the universities who we do, we're in close partnership uh, with. You can see there's a lot of household names there and some small medium enterprises from Ireland 
um, up there also. And the tagline that we wanted to focus on out of what we're trying to do is that we, m we made it in Ireland. And that obviously means that we physically made it here, but that we also made it in the context of being successful, I guess, as an organisation. This research centre is a different type of model uh, than you would typically find in, in the more fundamental uh, research centres, which I know um, Darren will be talking about later on. Um, it's a new type of research centre. It's, it's focusing on the, the technology readiness levels between four and seven and eight, rather than the TRL levels one, two and three, which is the more fundamental research that you would find in typically, say, in a university environment. Um, we're trying to bridge a gap that we believe exists in Ireland, um, which other European countries have solved with, with institutes like the Fraunhofer Institute, etc., or catapult centres in the UK, where we're trying to take good IP that's been developed in the university environment or in our own labs, work very closely with industrial partners and figure a way to take that good IP and develop new products and get them to market. That's the focus of what we're trying to do. So we're trying to carry the research, the fundamental stuff, across that what's typically known as the valley of death. In, in the, European, the Euro, in Europe, um, European Union would refer to it as the valley of death. To take that good IP and get it across to the market. So how do you do that? Our trick is we take our technology and we get it into the manufacturing floor fast and early. Okay, so in the ecosystem in Ireland, there are many types of centres. Uh, the SFI centres will be discussed later on. Um, if we look at the uh, Technology Centre programme, which is funded by Enterprise Ireland and the DI, there are 15 of these centres that exist today. Um, some of these centres are uh, standalone research centres, similar to the one that I've just described, uh, the, the Irish Manufacturing Research Centre. Um, but some of them are embedded within the university environment. But typically, they are closer to market in terms of on the fundamental research um, level. If I look at this and uh, the Irish Manufacturing Research uh, uh, Company and where it's positioned in the ecosystem, um, we, we have over on, on the left-hand side there all the, the, the universities who are doing the more fundamental research. We've got close partnerships uh, with a, a large number of universities. We have partnerships going with uh, organisations in Europe, like EFRA, or the Catapult Centre Group in the UK. Um, and there are other uh, bodies and organisations that we are doing some uh, contract research uh, today. The idea is we take these, these partnerships, we do some joint research together, and then we take that technology and quickly get it out to the marketplace. And so we partner with the companies in the network organisations uh, to drive those technologies out to market. And I'll discuss a couple of these uh, topics now in just a few moments. It's an independent, not-for-profit organisation. Why do we do that? We wanted to make, maximise our flexibility, to generate real accountability with the industrial partners who are working with us in the centre, to drive real commitment from them, because often the commitment can be a little bit on the side and not fully involved. Um, we have an industrial ethos in terms of how we work within the organisation that's a little bit different than maybe the way the university uh, system would, would operate um, because of the other criteria that they have to and other objectives that they have to uh, deliver upon. As pilots are live in the manufacturing floor, the time to market is shortened. As the lab environment is primarily within the factories, uh, industry uh, needs to have more control in terms of what was going on within their organisation. It's an easy to engage consortium model for companies. And we've got significant expertise in manufacturing residing in industry in this country that we really want to tap into and to help us with that translational research to job creation. Um, and the IP is fundamentally owned by the Centre for the benefit of Ireland. And we believe it to be a missing pillar to help translate some of that fantastic academic research that's going on and um, to bring it out into the industrial world. How it works as a centre, we have this crawl, walk, run strategy where we do um, uh, scope out the opportunity in workshops uh, such as, I'll uh, just describe one of the projects that we were working on was an air handling fault detection capability that we did in, in partnership with University College Cork and University of Galway. Um, and we, did, we, we delivered a, a fault detection capability that you can pick up within air handling units. We ran that pilot in uh, four companies where we found the pro product to be sig very, very significantly um, successful. It um, so much so that we decided then to spin it out as a company and we're in the process of bringing that to market today. We discovered that it could find faults in almost all air handling units that we had tested it out on. That on average was costing per air handling unit about 10,000 per annum if you didn't fix the faults that, that were in the systems. So if you can imagine in a large scale uh, factory you could have anything over 200 air handling units. So you can see that it's a significant opportunity with this kind of a fault detection 
detection capability. And so we're looking at spinning that out as, as, a, as a company now in the marketplace. Pyramid of research, uh, the way we do it, we get the companies together, we do best known method sharing. That helps to, us to understand where the gaps are in, in industry. We build out some development and innovation programs from that, and then, and then the really tough problems to solve uh, form what's called our core research projects, which we, we, we primarily focus on partnering with the university environment to help solve. We have a list of metrics that are a little bit different typically find in other types of research centres. At the top level, it's about international competitiveness. Beneath that, it's the company metrics, you know, those who par participate in the research, that they get productivity improvement, workforce flexibility, innovation, and that they get non-value-add process reduction. That we have the projects themselves would deliver better efficiency in, in their equipment, and um, that the meantime between failure would improve um, on their systems and machines, that they have cycle time reduction in their manufacturing line, that the time to market would be shortened, etc. And then at the very bottom of the, of the pyramid, um, we, we have things such as papers and publications and licenses, but that's not about what this center, this center is about achieving uh, competitiveness in the marketplace. So the structure of the center is a standalone, it's embedded, it's a not-for-profit organization, as I said earlier, and it's an accountable and open center model. So there's lots of opportunities for companies to get involved in the type of research that we do here. The reasons why they would want to get involved is peer-to-peer -peer opportunities, business-to-business -business opportunities, pilot site access. We've got lots of open forum days for, for companies to participate in, um, opportunities for um, VC opportunities, and opportunities to get involved in our awards night and things like that that we organize. It's a path into research if companies haven't done it before. It's a simplified engagement model. Um, an opportunity if you want to engage in research in Europe, we can provide a pathway in there. And an opportunity to participate in some of the white paper publications that we've been putting together. Um, it's an opportunity for some uh, branded marketing um, within the organization um, and for participate in such things as our website, where there's a lot of sharing of information and research projects and things. The teams that we, we, we work on in the manufacturing area are, are just five primary pillars that we're working on today, although that will be expected to change in time as priorities change, but it's the area of manufacturing informatics, operational excellence, supply chain management, 3D additive we're working on at the moment, and factory four. Um, we're, in the, we're currently running a number of workshops focused in 3D additive and factory four. If any of you are interested, please uh, follow up with me afterwards. I'll be only too delighted to tell you more about that and when they're on. To give you a sense of some of the projects that we were working on there, we've just delivered or are in the process of spinning out our second company um, in, the, in the manufacturing informatics area of research where we've delivered a, a, a knowledge system, a, a decision support tool for our manufacturers to help companies figure out the best way and, or the most optimum way to run production through their manufacturing line. And we're seeing significant improvement in, on the sites that we've run this today, upwards of 20% improvement on those manufacturing lines that we've been uh, running this particular technology. Thematic areas for energy research are in the area of, of water, compressed air, combined heat and power, chilled water and refrigeration systems, energy from low-grade heat, um, energy metrics and standards, energy management, air handling units and lighting. And I already just spoke to you there about the, the air handling uh, system and the spin-out company, for instance, that we're trying to get out to market today. So we've researched topics working in, in all these particular areas of research. Again, the trick about the research that we do here, it's very applied, it's very near to market, and it's about taking good technology and getting it piloted in on the manufacturing floors um, fast and in a shortened time window. Other projects that we have uh, been working on in terms of generic to both centres, um, where we're, we have a product now which we're pushing out to the marketplace again. It was in partnership with uh, University um, of Limerick and in Trinity College Dublin and ourselves, where we looked at the whole area of tacit knowledge and how you'd capture tacit knowledge that exists within organisations. In the same way today, if you wanted to fix your lawnmower, you would uh, most likely go on the internet and uh, YouTube. Um, we have uh, built what we call the YouTube, Amazon, Facebook experience um, for manufacturers where within a controlled environment this kind of information and data is being captured. So um, these are the kind of technologies, the kind of research that we're doing and, uh, and we're open for business and um, companies who'd like to get involved with us in, in the research that we're doing would be delighted to talk to you. Universities that have good ideas and you want some help to try and get it out to the marketplace, we've got some um, good um, opportunities for you. If you'd like to participate with us, we'd love to hear more from you. So with that in mind, um, I'd just like to uh, hand over to, I guess, the next speaker. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Brett. Okay, so my name is Darren Morrissey. Um, I'm the Director of Programmes with Science Foundation Ireland. Um, thank you for the invitation from, from Connor and Paul to present today. Um, what I'm going to focus on is Science Foundation Ireland and its delivery of funding to um, higher education institutions, but also how that overlaps with industry and where industry and enterprise can get involved. The structure of today's presentation is going to be very much on a bit of explanation about who we are, because we're probably one of the newer agencies around. Um, SFI's research funding programs with a particular flavour of, of enterprise facing and then also give a little bit of insight into I suppose the so what of our investment and what it delivers in terms of impact um, which I think is really important as well as that at the back of the deck I've left um, a bunch of case studies which could be of interest to people so they'll be circulated afterwards won't go into them in detail so first and foremost onto who SFI are and I suppose the first thing to say is that, and it's something that probably, you know, a misconception from in some quarters is that we we are an agency within Department of Enterprise, Jobs, uh, Jobs Enterprise and Innovation. Um, we, we sit as a, a sister agency with Enterprise Ireland and IDA, and we work increasingly hand in hand with our sister agencies to deliver against the, the uh, enterprise agenda. Founded back in 2000 and kind of really kick-started as it, uh, in terms of activity between 2001 and 2003. We were, we were really up and running in 2003. And um, what we've done over those, I suppose, intervening 12 or 13 or 14 years is that we've delivered funding uh, to, to the tune of 2.2 billion or thereabouts into the, to the, uh, the universities and institutes of, institutes of technology. And that accumulates out into about 4,000 awards to researchers in Ireland. And as of today, or we always have a 12-month um, lag period, um, 730 awards are thereabouts uh, to the tune of nearly half a billion, or half, half a billion uh, euros worth of Irish taxpayers' investment. Um, and that, I suppose, annually accumulates out at 160 million per year. So that's our budget every year that goes out into the research ecosystem. A couple of years back, we did, if we, originally I suppose we were modelled on the National Science Foundation in the US, which is quite basic science oriented, the funding of basic oriented science. And what we changed tack in the, in, in the last number of years for good pragmatic reasons, which are ones that are founded in uh, the economic challenges of the last five or six years. Um, and through a legislation, piece, piece of legislation that adapted our, our, our raison d'etre, we also then consequently changed our strategy um, to the, to, out to 2020, which is this Agenda 2020 document. And really, this was the big change, I suppose the manifest change is that we've moved to just funding basic oriented research to funding basic ori oriented research and moving into the applied space as well. So we now can fund science, technology, engineering, mathematics in that across that continuum. Um, and you can see that you know we really emphasise the delivery of impact from excellent research, number one, uh, and also um, secondarily, but re equally important, the building of partnerships with other funding agencies internationally, but also the building of partnerships between your researchers and your academic centres and industry. So going back to this continuum then, if you were to, and, and Barry has already alluded to the TRL scale and one to nine, and we all know what that is, um, what we now do is we fund in the in the zero through to uh, in or around four or five space, crossing over nicely with EI and consequently trying to bridge that valley of death, uh, which Barry referenced, and IDA ob obviously also funds in the uh, the research space, but for the multinational companies and at the far end of the the, the, the TRL uh, zero to nine scale. So again, you get a sense of a certain amount of joined up. I would like to think very joined up um, uh, activity by the three agencies. Moving on to our funding programmes, so Science Foundation Ireland, we fund into the universities, the IOTs, the likes of Tyndall and, and Tagusk and, and your, your, um, your, your more RTO models as well. And we do that through around 30 funding programmes, which I'm not going to go next to near in this presentation. But I will just fo focus in on a few of them. Uh, the six 
down the bottom six that are quite industry and enterprise facing. You can see the range, though I won't reference the slide so much, but you can see the range of, of what we're trying to promote as well, from early to, early to mid-career uh, development for researchers, um, large-scale centres, international programmes, uh, and, and so on. So you can see it's across a continuum, and um, I'm only going to focus on the, the more applied side today. The six, six programmes, I should say, that I'm going to describe, and in fact I'll only focus on five of them to any great extent, are the Research Centres programme, the Research Centre Spokes, SFI Partnerships, Industry Fellowships, and the Research Professorships, if time allows. Um, first and foremost, I want to focus on the Research Centres, which again Barry referenced, and I reflect the 12 current centres in a minute, I'll go into a little bit of detail on those, but I just wanted to give you an idea of, the f of how it works. So basically, the research centres are an initiative that was kicked off back in 2012, and it was with a view to, I suppose, really uh, maximising on the potential of great research going on in different locations in Ireland, and also to maximise on opportunities that were happening internationally and really building, I suppose, on the, the expertise and the skills of, of, a, of a broad group of people, but pulling, pulling them together and trying to make the sum of the parts far greater than the, the individual pieces. So it's a hub-and-spoke model, um, 12 centres that are based across all of our Ireland's um, universities and quite a few of the IOTs, and um, in, so involving partnership between uh, researchers on the ground. And the real key bit for us is that we fund between a million and seven million annually into each centre, um, but the key bit is a 70-30 split between uh, state money and industry partner money. So 30% so of the funds needs to come from uh, industry. And of that, a third of that 30% needs to be in cash form. So it's a 10-20 split between cash and in kind. And that's a new um, evolution. So we would have had previous iterations, which was our strategic research clusters and our CSETs, which is a different model going back maybe five years or so but we never focused to the same extent on that industry partnership. Now we do, we have, we're very focused on it in terms of metrics, in terms of annual metrics and even six monthly metrics and trying to drive that, um, uh, I suppose, academic delivery uh, of partnership at, at, at its core. You can see the numbers there. So 335 million invested in and leveraging out another 190 million in, uh, in industry resource. These are the 12 research centres. So basically, we are focusing on quite targeted areas, areas that to a large extent overlap with national research prioritization areas. So in the pharma space, but not in pharma drug discovery, in pharma um, uh, pro process engineering uh, at the more end stage of, of pharma production. So that's the SSP se SSPC center, which is led out of Limerick, but involves a broad range of universities and IOTs. In the health space, we've got uh, APC, which is Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre, and the Infant Centre, which are, is focused on fetal and uh, fetal health. We've got the Medical Devices Group, headed up out of NUIG, um, and also it's involving other, other institutes. We've got Materials, Advanced Materials, which is the Amber Institute, um, or Amber Group, which is working within the Cran Institute in TCD, again, involving other universities and IOTs as well. Photonics based primarily out of Tyndall, the IPC centre. The, in the ICT and digital space, we've got Insight, which is our biggest centre, which is to the tune of in or around 70 million collective funding over, over four to six years. And um, it's basically led out of four universities, uh, NUIG, UCD, DCU and UCC. You've got the Lero software centre, predominantly led out of UL, ADAPT out of TCD, and connected also out of TCD. So ADAPT focuses on digital content, connect out of more um, connected technology, um, wireless and so on. And then Geosciences, which is the ICAG Craig group out of UCD, and MARI, um, which I gather Krahura Brodick would have spoken at one of these, these meetings, led out of UC UCC predominantly, but also involving NUIG, NUIM, and, and other, other locations. So that's a bit of a whistle stop, but you get a sense of the 12 and the breadth of the 12. The obvious question is, will there be more? And um, it's a, qu a question that I probably can't answer today. Suffice it to say that there is room for uh, development in probably another three or four, maybe five uh, centres. That's probably our capacity as a country. Um, I'm going to move back. So a way that industry today can engage in existing centres or pre-existing centres is our research centre spokes model. So basically what we do in this instance is that 
as an opportunity for an academic partner to come together with industry or a group of industry partners and through either a fixed call or a rolling call, uh, which is the terminology we use, essentially fixed call is at the end of every year we put out a call um, and it, it's a competitive process. So basically uh, proposals come in and because it is a competitive process, we look for a 70-30 split state to non-state money. However, you don't have to wait for that deadline with a rolling call. You can submit, again, an academic partner with industry, uh, and because it's non-competitive and it can be received any time, in th that instance, we're looking for a 50-50 split, with the 50% being fully, full cash involvement. And you might imagine that, that you, we don't get much success you know, in attracting that level of co-investment and partnership. In fact, we're starting to yield great, great results. Um, so a number of partnerships coming in, we're up into you know the territory of a million, a million to a million shared, uh, 1.5 million to 1.5 million. So there's it's quite a, a number of high-scale uh, spokes plugging into the existing uh, research centres. All right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to the industry fellowship. So we've covered research centres and spokes. Spokes a way of plugging into research centres. If you're an industry, potential industry partner, and you're wanting to sample the wares of uh, research institutes in Ireland, a very simple way to do it that involves partnership thinking, but not partnership resourcing, so in fact it's all state money going into this, it's the industry fellowship. And the industry fellowship is a way of either accessing a researcher to come from academia to work in your industry site, your industry location, and that's anywhere in the world. So it can be in Ireland or it can be, it can be elsewhere or for the movement to go the other direction. So an industry partner to move into an academic institution and work with a, a researcher. In that instance, um, in both those instances, it's either a full-time year, so up to a maximum of a year, or a part-time two years, because okay, there's a bit of flexibility there. It's to the tune of up to 120K um, in total costs that we would put out to the uh, academic partner. So we pay the academic partner, who then distributes accordingly. Um, and it is peer reviewed, so in fact we br we bring it through a costing model. So in fact it isn't, you know, an easy way to get 120k of resource. It needs to be well justified and with research at its core. But at this stage we have about 25 business. Well, we d we run this call twice a year, and we've moved from in you know, around you know 10 or maybe 10 or 12 successful applications three iterations ago to the most recent um, release of funding to 25 um, industry partners or, or academic industry partnerships. So it's again, it's, a, it's starting to scale and we absolutely love to see this um, be something that you know we see in the hundreds, not in the tens. So we, we, this is an opportunity for research partners to really engage. Um, as I say, two calls annually and the next one is closing the end of June, so I'll flag that. Sorry, one other comment. There is no limit. It's on the slide. Industry partners, you can go for as many as they want, uh, but again, each one needs to be justified individually. Going to move on to SFI partnerships. So if spokes was a way of engaging pre-existing centres, which I named the centres, partnerships is a way of doing something similar, but where there are no pre-existing centres. So it's a way of actually just tapping into the resources and the, uh, the, the intellectual capital and the research ongoing in whatever university, whatever IOT, um, it's something that, again, the academic partner needs to uh, apply for, uh, for a partnership. And there's two models that we work with. One is strategic partnerships, and that's really, really flexible. That is a piece of research where you work together, industry partner to academic, and come up with a, a joint proposal, which we evaluate, again, using international peer review. Uh, and again, in terms of scalability here, we're talking, you know, our biggest partnership to date has been a 2.5 to 2.5 million euro 50-50 partnership involving a big multinational. So again, it's at that scale. Uh, we, we don't usually go below a 400k to 400k threshold. So again, we're looking for, for partnerships of scale. Um, the competitive joint funding partnership is a model that we use to engage where we go for the, with, for the likes of Pfizer jointly together uh, an SFI Pfizer uh, partnership where we put a call out to get researchers to apply to that call and apply for funding in the biotherapeutic space. That's just an example of, of what a competitive call looks like. But again, for, for more greenfield and immediate access, strategic partnership is the way to go. And lastly, I suppose the one I just want to mention is prof uh, research professorships. Professorship, the professor professorship program is a way of attracting international talent to Irish universities or IOTs. 
in particularly targeted areas where we have, I suppose, deficits and, and, and need to increase our, our, skill, our skills quotient. Um, in this instance, uh, we have run it as a targeted call most recently, but it also is the potential for uh, rolling, rolling submissions to come in. And the reason why I mention it is that it is something that industry can tap into in the sense that if, if industry feel or if industry, an industry potential industry partner feels that there is a gap in a particular university, they can propose uh, through the university for a particular professor to be to be hired. In this instance, it, go, it goes to the highest level of peer review. So I mean, it's not an easy thing to to acquire. However, if successful, candidates can 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 draw down up to five million euros worth of funding over five years from SFI and the university picks up the salary, so it's a, a shared model. And in some instances, we've seen industry partners come in and actually co-fund on the salary as well, or, or, or certainly work with the university to attract the individual in. So it's something that doesn't come with you know, industry labels, but industry can certainly tap into that. And uh, the academic partners are really, really finding this, um, this is a great device to increase their, their capital, their, their human capital on site. Okay. So that's a whistle stop through the the the, um, the the programs that are of most relevance. I'm going to leave I'm going to leave that aside and just kind of flag before I get to the very tail tail end that clearly our programs are complex in nature. They involve peer review, so they involve submissions with full proposals and, and lots of detail. It needs to be talked through with somebody from from our team. So I got my details. Obviously, you know I'm, I'm contactable on that directly. But uh, we also have a series of program managers who come out and sit with researchers and go through the ins and outs of the various programs, even beyond the, the academic programs. So I wanted to just get that on record now before I forget it at the end. Impact is what we're all trying to deliver. Uh, on one hand, when we talk about impact, we think about the academic impacts that come out, like papers and so on. And in terms of what we put in, um, a research engine of two, uh, over 2,500 people funded 450 uh, primary uh, investigators, so PIs, 12 centres, uh, over 700 active awards. And what that ge generates annually in academic terms is in the region of 2,200 two, um, uh, scientific papers publications, which is you know, your, your hard currency uh, for many. Uh, for, again, in an academic sense, collaboration is key. And you know, again, we've got lots of collaboration. And what that does is it's pushed in the, the years since SFI was founded, it's pushed Ireland up the, the rankings in terms of our academic st um, status. So the quality of our scientific research has, has pushed us into the top 20 in the last five or six years, and we're still there. We've maintained that in spite of um, austerity and, and the downturn and slightly lower funding. Um, we're highlighted as one of the five up and coming countries uh, by Nature Magazine in the last, or Na Nature Journal in the last number of years. And as well, we rank very highly in different thematic areas. And they're thematic areas that we've you know, focused on for the preceding 10 years. So again, the investment in academically actually works. However, academic in impact is only one side of the story. We also have economic impact. And that same investment is yielding all of this economic impact, which I think just needs to be flagged. Um, our latest numbers in 2013 show that we had, we had for, the, for every euro we had put in of 160 million annually, we were leveraging another 150 euros, uh, or another euro, I should say, of uh, non-SFI, non-state funding. Now, that would be a combination of industry funding and also European Horizon 2020 funding, so about a 50-50 drawdown. Four spin-outs companies, which sounds low, but actually last year it was it was informally i can tell you that it's between eight and nine companies and again when you measure that up against ei's targets you know it's contributing certainly to the, you know the numbers spin outs are hard to come by um but it's a, a good solid number 27 license agreements you could read the slide yourself no, me, no need for me to read through it but the really big thing is the number of collaborations that are happening with smes and mncs multinationals Again, no need to go through the logos, but as many as 900 collaborations with SFI researchers from an interesting blend in that it's, you would imagine that it's more multinationals might be working in this space, but it's actually a 50-50 between multinationals and SMEs. And the real target for us is, is to increase the number of MNCs involved because of all the multinational companies in Ireland, only about 50% engage in uh, the Irish academic scene for research. So there's a big you know, improvement we can make there. And again, in the SME world, th similar improvements can be made, particularly if we approach things on a regional by regional basis, and that's something that, again, we're looking at. Um, 
but again, you can see the benefits. One thing I want to mention, two minutes, great. One th but as a, in the, the last two minutes, very, we're very conscious as an organization that engineers, because of our, I should say, I hazard to say, because of our more basic uh, orientation for the first eight or nine years of our existence, have possibly not been drawing down the level of funding that they have required and that you know, they could potentially have drawn down uh, in terms of research funding. Um, as we move to more uh, applied funding to uh, incorporate it across the, the spectrum, I believe that engineers can draw down more funding. However, we're not sure that the existing structures that we have and the existing way that we interact with engineers is perfect. So what we're going to do is we are going to engage in a, a piece of consultation, starting with the heads of engineering in the various universities and IOTs, and I suppose trickle that down through the engineering community in the next three or four months, or two or, two or three months. Hope, we're hoping to read out in July. Uh, and we're going to do a survey. Again, you can read the slides as to what we're really focusing on. But for me, uh, the two key questions are, do you feel that SFI's programs that all 30 of them, but particularly the ones I focused on, are suitable for funding of engineering-oriented research projects. And I suppose the second one is, do you feel that SFI's review procedures are suitable? Because again, we're very conscious that quite often you've got uh, um, access can be difficult because we set a threshold uh, uh, below which certain people can't apply. And again, we just want to make sure that that threshold is correct and accurate and reflective of potential for the engineering research community. So watch this space, but you'll see this coming through. Uh, again, professors of engineering in, in the colleges, but also through a survey monkey. And e, that is my summary slide. I suppose suffice it to say, I leave it as one note for business. Uh, I re reiterate that I'm here to contact afterwards um, with any questions or someone on my team. We have a website where you can get details of the various programs that we have. Uh, and as well as that, if you're looking, if, if industry partners are looking to engage with researchers, a really good repository of that information is the KTI database, um, which I'm sure that Barry is going to, to mention. So on that note, I'll sign off. Okay. Um, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank Connor for inviting me to talk. I'm uh, Sean Lines. I'm the manager of the Applied Polymer Technology Gateway at, AI at AIT. It's part of the Technology Gateway Program, which is funded by Enterprise Ireland, and I'm going to try and explain that in the next couple of minutes. Uh, and that is not an uh, easy task. So, what is the Technology Gateway? Well, there are 12 of them, and they are funded in eight of the IOTs. Um, the technology gateways are basically portals, uh, access points to research in inf infrastructure in the IOTs. Um, they're thematically chosen, so basically each of the gateways has shown and has a track record of excellence in their chosen field. Uh, they were competitively funded by Enterprise Ireland, so we had to prove that we were good at what we were saying we were good at, rather than just being good at it. Our main focus is on the later TRLs, is on close to market needs, so troubleshooting, process development, process optimization, product development. Um, a lot of it isn't about the blue sky basic research. Um, each of the gateways will do that, obviously, with a view to later on commercializing that research and transferring it to industry. But in our workings with industry, it's about doing the close to market things. So our research projects can be anything from two hours testing to two weeks to two years. I suppose when the guys talked about metrics earlier, a good one is um, the gateways have recently completed a questionnaire like SFI are about to kick off. And, and what that has focused on is the Technology Gateway Program's predecessor, the ARE, and the new TGP programs. And it's looked at investment from companies um, through the last couple of years. And as you can see, even during the recession, we have had quite an increase. Um, that industrial collaborations number of, of 300 uh, that ranges, again, from everything from a 200 euro collaboration to a 400,000 euro collaboration. Um, we predominantly have quite a large number of innovation vouchers, which are funded by Enterprise Ireland, larger innovation partnership programs, again, funded by Enterprise Ireland, and then projects directly funded by industry for a range of reasons. Um, as well as that, the technology gateways would also be heavily involved in some of the other research infrastructure in, the college, uh, in, in, in Ireland, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. I suppose the, the important thing to note here is that what the gateways focus on is not dissimilar to what
research centres focus on. But the real problem is, in Ireland, where do you start? How do you talk to someone in IRT about, about research? How do you know who to talk to? So you think of technology gateways less like centres and more like business development. So what we do is we're the person who knows who to talk to. So we're a point of access. So of those 12 research centres that I point to, uh, those 12 gateways that I talked about, you can call any centre manager and they will know who to talk to. They'll know who to put you in touch with, whether it's an SFI centre or an EI centre or one of the other gateways. So we really are there to be a first step, a portal into the research infrastructure in Ireland. We may not have the answers you want, but we probably know the person who does. And that's probably the best way to describe a technology gateway. So as well as this sort of um, very, very, very applied research funding, what we also do is background research. Um, I suppose the only way I can describe this is by talking about my gateway, which is the Applied Polymer Technology one. Uh, this was funded out of AIT. Uh, the two principal investigators are Dr. Luke Giver and Professor Clem Higginbottom. And what we do is we look at plastics, polymer engineering. And I suppose the reason we do is plastics is a huge part of the Irish economy. Uh, there's a lot of companies who are plastics processors in Ireland. Equally, there's a lot of companies who do plastics processing who don't call themselves plastic processors. You can think of any of the biomedical companies, any of the pharmaceutical companies. A lot of them will use plastics as excipients, or your catheters made of plastics, or your inhalers made of polymer, etc., etc. So it's a huge area, and we, um, we operate at the very center of it. And the reason we do that is that since AI, Athlone IT was an IT, when it was an RTC, it was the only place in Ireland you could do plastics engineering. And that remains true for polymer engineering courses. Uh, we are the only place you can do a fully funded full uh, engineering degree, and as well as that, we do a lot of masters and PhD research. Uh, the unique part of AIT, I suppose, is because we've been in the business so long, we've trained a lot of the people in the business, and also we have the probably the best plastics infrastructure. So, what we look at is industry-focused applied research. So, very very focused applied research. We do our own basic research, so that generates some papers, and it also generates some base knowledge that we may look to commercialise in the future and then we commercialise our own internal research once it's reached a point where we feel that industry partners might be interested in it. I suppose I mentioned earlier that we, we work with some of the other centres, and good examples are the SSPC, which is one of SFI, and ICOMP, which is an IDA EI centre. Um, what we work with on these is, is very, very different programmes. So with SSPC, we're looking at production of polymer capsules or extrusion of polymer materials that contain drugs. These are for controlled release drug devices. With ICOMP, we're looking at thermoplastic composites, so things like light weighting of aircraft parts um, right up to replacement of your metal gutter covers with thermoplastics, so reinforcement com composite manufacturing. Um, what's interesting about this, I suppose, is if you look at the SSPC centre, which focuses hu on, on humans, uh, what APT has brought to that, as well as pro the polymer processing uh, knowledge, is things like well, we're all the same in the dark, and uh, animals have very similar uh, digestive tracts to us, and a lot of the controlled release technology that has been developed for humans, or is being developed for humans, can be easily developed for animals. And because you're not having to use the same expensive pharmaceuticals, you might actually be able to manufacture that stuff quite a bit cheaper. So we've actually worked quite a bit on things like mineral release of, of, of materials from polymers for animals, and we've worked on that in partnership with companies and commercialised it. The really important thing, I suppose, is the only dedicated industrial and pilot scale processing facility in Ireland. So in other places, you might find lab-based extruders and injection motors. In, our, in at AIT, you'll find industry scale ones. So everything we have is based on an industrial model. Uh, it is not small. It's not there to be um, used by a student. Uh, our injection molding machines are 60 ton presses. Our extruders are 100 kilo an hour extruders. So. I suppose what we do really is, is less, than, less than focus on thematic streams, but we focus more on technologies. So the, the core ones are extrusion, injection molding, blow molding, and thermoforming. And what these are useful for is you think of packaging, you think of manufacturing. These are the technologies you will use for plastics. So rather than go into everything, I, I thought I'd briefly talk you through some of the equipment that would be used for. So a twin screw extrusion, we've got everything from a small 16 mil one to a 27 mil one. I suppose the difference there is output. What you look at there is compounding additives into polymers. Things like reinforcement, things like drugs, things like colours. 
huge um, huge business and it's not just aimed at medical device companies which we work with it's also based with smaller companies so if you think about your corrugated piping under your motorways that is a filled HDPE material probably compounded first in AIT if you think of your bismuth um, lead uh, or bismuth materials that are in catheters for be being radio opaque again compounded using twin screw extrusion so these sort of technologies are applied to lots of very varied uh, industries in Ireland. Single screw extrusion is what your catheters are manufactured using. It's what tubing is manufactured using. We have everything from small filament and profile ones to a tube one. Uh, said new facility available Q2. It arrived last Wednesday. I'm very proud. Um, <coughs> we have a, a melt uh, fibre spinning line arriving this summer, which is being co-funded by a very large PT supplier in Ireland. Um, I suppose part of our remit is not just to be doing research, but to be doing research that suits companies. So in this case, we actively go out to companies and ask them, given our infrastructure, is there something we're missing? And if they feel strongly enough about it, we ask them, well, if we pony up some of the cash, will you? And in the case of the Mel Fibre Spinning Line, they are. And that, that, that facility will be available, hopefully, over the summer. We also do quite a bit of extrusion blow moulding, which is commonly used in everything from making the packages your power drills come in to making the single-use um, vials your pharmaceuticals come in. I suppose when it comes to injection moulding, everyone's kind of familiar with what injection moulding is. Um, everything from your toothbrush is manufactured that way to some plastic bottles, etc., etc. What we, what we look at is from micro to 60 ton injection molding. That doesn't mean the machine weighs 60 tons, by the way. It means it clamps, its clamping force is about 60 tons. That 60 ton machine, I think, weighs six tons, um, which is all, it's always much more impressive to say the 60 ton number, though. Uh, we also do quite a bit of overmolding, and you'll find that all the medical device manufacturers do quite a bit of overmolding of balloons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in many cases, there's quite a large uh, medical device cluster in Galway with the likes of Cregana, Merritt, Boston Scientific, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We would send quite a lot of our graduates there, um, and as a result, we would tend to try to make sure our equipment would be as good as their facility, so that a our undergraduates and postgraduates are well trained. Uh, and ready for their future employment, but B, that we're, we're using our plastics uh, equipment in research to do what the companies need us to do. We do quite a bit of 3D printing. Um, some of what we do for the SSPC, I mentioned control release applications, is 3D printing of drug-loaded polymers into complex shapes. Um, we also do quite a bit of compression molding and thermoforming, more for packaging applications. So. For instance, there's a small bakery um, in the middle of Ireland that makes all the Domino's pizza bases for the country. Um, and they had a packaging issue. They had just bought a new packaging line, and it wouldn't work. Their pizza bases kept going off very, very quickly. So something like that is somewhere they call us. I put them in touch with the correct PI. They have a meeting. The guy has a look at their packaging line and talks to them about the materials they're using. We do a few trials, and the problem is fixed in two or three days. So this is the sort of industrial engagement we talk about. It's not a long project. Probably in, it's contract research, effectively. Um, I don't really like the term R&D to a certain extent, research and development. I don't think it suits the gateways. I think, I think what we do is development and research. I think we, we do development or troubleshooting of the project. We do as, no, as much research as is needed to fix the problem, but not much more than is basic. Um, I wanted to do some case studies, and I was thinking about what case studies I should talk to you about. And I figured, if I'm going after SFI, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do something that's too technical. So what I wanted to talk about was, particularly with our recession, um, I wanted to talk about something very, very straightforward. Um, and this is a great one, because it's a company that's in the construction industry. And basically, they sell small stone slips for fixing onto the outsides of houses. They make all our houses look nice. Um, they came to us first, and their main problem was, while their stone slips were aesthetically pleasing, they had no insulation value whatsoever. So, you know, they were really only for the vein among us. So, using some um, innovation vouchers that we got from Enterprise Ireland, we, we patented uh, a composite material for them. We went into an innovation partnership feasibility to see, well, with an actual strategic partnership, can we actually develop this? And then we started an innovation partnership earlier this year. So I'm going to show you some of the outputs of that uh, to begin with. So here's our test house. It's a nice house. It's, uh, it's a nice little porch, but it's a very cold porch. And here is the new product. Um, I know it doesn't look awfully fancy, but there's quite a bit to it. So what you're seeing there is their thin block slips, uh, a bespoke polyurethane adhesive, which we've patented, a bespoke polyurethane foam insulation, which is patented, and a, magne a commercial magnesium silicate board, which is there for fire insulation. 
This is coming in a, a Z-shaped composite, so it's easy for anyone to put together. The idea being you can fit out your house in under two days. Uh, come straight from the factory to be put together and hopefully lo finish looking like this and you can't see that it's a Lego piece. I suppose the reason I wanted to give this example is lots of companies think, you know, I'm only a small company. I can't get involved with research infrastructure in Ireland. So Westport Stoneworks is four people. It's not a big company. It's not even an SME. It's just a small company with a good idea. So the idea of research infrastructure in Ireland is not just to cater to the Bosch and Loms of the world or the Intels of the world. It's to cater to everyone. So the idea of the gateways is sometimes people like SFI or IDA or, Engine or Enterprise Ireland can be quite large large groups and be very very difficult for a small company to think well how do I engage with them so the idea to the gateways is we're the portal we're the first person you come to and we'll put you in touch with the right person whether it's put in touch with SFI whether it's putting in touch with engineer with enterprise aren't etc etc and in some cases there are so many funding mechanisms available that even getting an idea of where the funding is who to talk to how to understand what you are and aren't eligible for you probably need to talk to somebody like us the other case study I'm going to talk to is sort of supply chain collaboration, because this is where the, where the gateways are particularly active. Because in our case, plastics is such a small industry, we kind of know everybody in it. So a good example here is Wellman International. They manufacture PET. Um, they, they basically make strand. Um, that PET can be used in lots of things. And Vitabond Limited, which are in that loan, and they consume some of Wellman's PET. Um, what we do is we work between both of them. We happen to be doing an innovation voucher with Vitabond. We happen to be doing a larger partnership with Wellman International. But because we're involved with both sides of this, we can actually help improve both of their products because we have key knowledge about their materials and processes. Another good example is a company who recently started manufacturing um, corrugated piping. We had just previously started working with a manufacturer of recycled polymers. We were able to put them together help get their processes to work together and find the corrugated piping supplier a cheap consumable polymer, help find the polymer supplier a, a good customer, and help ma make sure that they pass the NSAI and NRA tests by making sure we use the material in the right, in the right way. So I suppose what's, what's different about the gateways to the other research centres is we're not a research centre. We're a portal into the infrastructure in Ireland. We're a portal into principal investigators in the Institute of Technologies. We're a portal into uh, specific funding models. So basically, what I suppose what I'm trying to say is, if you're struggling to figure out where to start, the Gateways is as good a place as any. And rather than finish with the we're open for business, uh, which everyone has used, there is a showcase for the Technology Gateways on the 18th uh, of this month in Cork. We'd heavily encourage everybody to come. It's a good day out. If nothing else, the sandwiches are nice. And with that, I will thank you all for listening to me and putting up with me for the last few minutes and uh, hand you over to the next speaker. Okay, so good, e good evening, everybody. I'm Barry Fennell from Knowledge Transfer Ireland, and thanks very much to Connor and Paul for the invitation to speak to you this evening. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next uh, 15 minutes or so is uh, tell you about Knowledge Transfer Ireland, what it does and how it can be of benefit to you. But before I do that, just very quickly, if you were an industry, uh, you were uh, an owner of an SME, and you had never engaged with universities before or research performing organisations, you may be asking yourself, why would I do it? What's in it for me? After all, engaging with academics, you know, all they do is teach. They turn out undergraduates. They uh, publish papers. Why would I bother? Why would I bother seeking out their expertise? Well, if you consider this, and if you, if you don't remember anything else I say tonight, but but perhaps you might remember this, that government an annually spends or makes available research expenditure under the heading of fundamental and applied research 700 million euro plus per year so this is the amount of money the irish government provides uh, to the agencies uh, to government departments uh, money which is made available on the horizon 2020 as a gdp uh, ratio each year hea hrb that figure is 700 million euro plus it's a staggering amount of money and I will be saying, more than likely, 
there is some academic or researcher in a research performing organization or some agency who is developing technology, uh, developing IP either today or will be in the future that's of relevant relevance to your business. So from the KTI perspective, we would encourage everybody, particularly people who haven't done it before, to engage with the system. Um, and the chances are there's somebody who has expertise which is, which is relevant to your business. So again, 700 million euro, it's quite a, quite a figure. Um, and also, the best way of doing that, we've heard tonight, or one of the best ways of doing it, if you've never done it before, is to go to the technology centres. Okay, so Barry has spoken uh, about how technology centres, for example, can bring you into Europe. Okay, Access Horizon 2020 funding, for example. Darren has very uh, eloquently outlined some of the programmes that are available through through an agency such as Science Foundation Ireland, and Paul very nicely has spoken about lab and equipment and the resources. So again, the message from 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 tonight and from KTI certainly is, centres exist. It's it's actually quite easy. To engage with the system okay centers exist and use them and, and engage with them is what we would say so these first two slides uh, have articulated that more eloquently than i've said it you get the competitive edge increase productivity etc develop new sales growth opportunities employ people and you're minimizing you do risk disengagement if you like and, and connor very uh, very uh, nicely gave me this slide and i think the, the illustration really highlights it quite well okay you, you de-risk the whole process okay and there are there are many other benefits as well so that's just the, the context you know for for the key message from kti if you like in terms of what we we would be encouraging you to do and um the last, the last bullet point there, for example, I'm not going to read down through all, all the slides, but in 2013, for example, to give you some figures, 1,600 new research agreements were signed, okay, with companies based in Ireland, and that figure is, is growing year on year. So companies are doing it, they're obviously doing it and getting benefit from it. So if you're not doing it, have a look and see what your peers within your community are doing and see how they're benefiting from it. So KTI was, was established uh, last year, um, and it's KTI stands for Knowledge Transfer Ireland. It's a central point of reference for business research uh, partnership and formation. Um, like every organization, we have a mission statement. But if I move on to the next slide uh, and, and talk to you very quickly about our history, uh, CTTO, Central Technology Transfer Office, uh, we're now known as Knowledge Transfer Ireland. So again, Knowledge Transfer Ireland uh, was established by government in recognition of the fact that there is a significant amount of money being provided into the research performing organisations. And government and politicians are increasingly asking questions, rightly so, what is happening with this expenditure? What's coming out of Irish taxpayers' money which has been put into these, uh, the, these organisations? And how is government and how are the respective agencies going to support <coughs> that uh, commercialisation of IP? So, you know, as we've heard from the speakers tonight, getting that IP, getting from the laboratory out into the commercial world, generating new sales and, and employing more and more people. So uh, KTI sits firmly, very firmly at the heart of, of that exercise, if you like. And going back, and I should also mention the National IP Protocol because this is this is quite important in this whole engagement process and in terms of what we're doing. The National IP Protocol was first published in 2012. Okay, a group of industry, investors, technology transfer people, government sat around the table and developed the IP Protocol. And out of the IP pr Protocol came a strong recommendation to create a central technology transfer office, which is now known as Knowledge Transfer Ireland. Okay, so before that, uh, technology transfer did exist, the community did exist, but now we have a formal recognized process for managing that whole uh, exercise and that whole subject area. So through Knowledge Transfer Ireland, we provide funding to technology transfer offices who sit in within research performing organizations. We fund that activity. With that money, they are obliged to meet certain um, criteria. Uh, they have their set of metrics, which is basically around providing a consistency of, of, of approach when industry engage, engages with researchers. Okay, So irrespective of who you are, and I'm going to flick straight through to this particular slide, um, 
KTI, in the first instance, will uh, enable business to leverage the commercial potential of, of uh, Irish research base. Uh, we're also striving to take the guesswork, as I said, out of uh, technology transfer. So if you're in industry and you're engaging with UCD, or if, whether it's uh, Letterkenny Institute of Technology, or CIT, or UL, you, there should be consistency of approach. You should get the same uh, response when it comes to IP management, due diligence, you should know what to expect when you engage with research performing organisations. And that's what KTI is setting out to do, okay, to bring that consistency of approach. So take the guesswork out of what you can expect when you engage with researchers, okay. So to our knowledge, nothing of this sort exists globally. And in fact, the Canadians and Serbians are contacting KTI uh, in terms of understanding uh, best practice in this area. So um, it's, it's quite a new and, and a novel um, uh, approach that we have in terms of supporting technology transfer, uh, particularly, uh, certainly wi within Ireland. And um, also, um, um, and most importantly, we provide funding to the technology tr transfer offices. Okay. So to date, we've, we've provided funding to the tune of 40 million euro. So with that funding, technology transfer offices are required to uh, hire in people as they see fit and uh, make available funding for, for patents, for example, but to ensure that within their own institution that they have the necessary skills and know-how to deliver on uh, and support academic industry engagement, which extends out to uh, management and due diligence all, around all things IP related. Um, so Knowledge Transfer Ireland, uh, we're a relatively small team, there's about six, there is six of us in total. Uh, I suppose one of the best ways or the immediate ways you, you can engage with us is through our website. Uh, I should also say that Knowledge Transfer Ireland is uh, it's both supported by Enterprise Ireland and the IUA. Uh, our director is Alison Campbell. We have an industry advisory board and we also have a knowledge transfer stakeholder forum as well. So um, we're certainly not conducting our business in isolation uh, and we're always very keen to hear from academia, the academic community. We work very closely with our agencies and we work very closely with industry. So again, the message really is if, if you have any issues or requirements, or you would you would like improvements in, in how you engage with industry, or how industry would like to engage better with academia, please come and talk to us, okay? We're, we're very much interested in, in engaging with the respective communities and receiving feedback. Uh, so onto our website, uh, there are various different information sets on our website. So again, KTI and the website will uh, brings together all relevant information around all the technology centers we've heard about uh, this evening, for example. So if, if you want to go to one particular website and find out what research centers are out there, so with SFI, I think there are 12 research centers in total. Uh, we have 15 technology centers, Enterprise Ireland technology centers. There are eight tech, tech gateways, 12 gateways. Uh, and again, all that information can be found in one location under the KTI website. Um, again, I'm going to keep flicking through these slides quite quickly because the previous speakers have gone through them. But again, uh, there is a myriad of, of research centres, technology gateways and uh, technology centres that currently exist. Okay? All the information around them is, is easily accessible. Uh, and again, the message consistent that we're constantly saying is uh, use the centres. Okay? they would be more than delighted to hear from industry. So if you have an issue or a problem today, engage with them. If you think that you would like to develop relationships with academics into the future, pick up the phone, go visit a, a technology center, uh, go to the events, um, as, as, as Paul said, there's an event coming up in Cork, and, and engage with the system, okay? Um, so yeah, going back to the last slide, current the medical devices one, we've heard, heard about ICMR tonight. Uh, Mary I, you would have heard from Cora Brodick uh, quite recently, as I understand it. We have the range of technology gateways. Uh, there may be centres that maybe are not totally obvious to you that, that perhaps could be relevant, such as iCheck. Okay? So, for example, um, big data is a field or a discipline which probably 
everybody probably has an interest in. So, so have a look at the centres, see what's out there. I check, I, I think are, are an interesting organisation that are probably relevant to 90% to, to, to of, of the audience. Uh, so what else does KTI do? What, what do we provide? Okay, well, if you're looking for a research expert, again, if you're a, a small SME, you've never engaged with the system before, go onto our website and type in keywords. If you're looking for expertise in a particular discipline or area, put it into the database and, and see what comes up, okay? So again, uh, if you're an academic and your details are not on the system, please come and talk to us, okay? Uh, this is a shop window for advertising your skill sets and advertising your institute or your organization. So again, there are lots of opportunities to market and brand yourself, and, and certainly the message again is, is do it, okay? Uh, when we come on to, so licensing opportunities. So again, you know, you're an SME, how do I delve down and understand what sort of license opportunities are out there? Or if you're a VC or an entrepreneur, you want to understand what's actually coming out, what sort of IP is being generated? Is, um, is, is it relevant to my area? Again, we have a section on our website which uh, details the latest opportunities, uh, la latest licensing opportunities right across a, 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 a complete set of thematic areas, particularly aligned to the research prioritization area. And again, uh, we asked the TTOs, the technology transfer offices, to send this information on to us on a monthly basis. So it is updated. And w one thing that I think is uh, is, is hugely uh, uh, relevant and, and, and of, of direct in interest to industry is our section on guide to agreements. So on that, this is really a resource for signposting uh, and, and supporting uh, and providing guidance around agreements such as CDAs, non-disclosure agreements, for example. There are model license agreements on that. Okay, so if you've never even had a look at a license agreement before, go onto the website and have a look at it and download it and read it and see what's actually contained within the license agreement. It'll give you a, fa a favor, a flavor of, of what sort of commitments you need to start considering when you want to engage with research performing organizations. And again, it'll give you an understanding of what their obligations are towards you as somebody in, in industry. There's uh, model option agreements, materials transfer agreements. And again, if these terms don't mean anything to you, go onto the website and familiarize yourself with this. Uh, so most recently, we've put up the heads of agreement for the Enterprise Ireland Innovation Partnership Program again. Okay, so again, have a look at it. Um, there's a section under IP explained, etc. So really just finishing off, you know, question, how do you measure success? How does KTI measure success? Well, it'll be around things like observing an increase in the number and size of engagements, uh, repeat engagements and the an increase in the speed of negotiation around IP okay so a final thought just to say again um, our ask of you is is to implore you and encourage you to to engage with research performing organizations whether it's third level institutes whether it's Chagas where there's the agencies. And again, as I said, that figure of 700 million euro plus is, is a staggering figure. So again, all the information is contained. And as I say, the, the centers are a fantastic way of, of engaging if you haven't done so before with the, uh, with the RPOs. I'll leave it at that. Okay, I'd like to thank all four speakers for excellent presentations, very, very informative, and throw the floor open to questions. Uh, collectively in terms of I engaging with industry um, is there a formal organizational structure to have program managers across all four of the particular um, research centers to be a person of contact to manage the whole process through from an, from an industry 
because from my own perspective within industry, you, you wouldn't know, uh, you wouldn't have the skill set actually to manage the whole process. So would that be total ownership from your perspective and you have a ded dedicated person to manage that whole, whole process through? And that's across all four. heard me anyway. Um, for the SFI research centres, which are the 12, um, we would have in those centres uh, a good kind of organisational structure with the centre lead, centre manager and then business development managers as well. So the short answer is on the research centres, yes. In the broader university and IoT um, environment, I suppose there's different ways of accessing. <coughs> SFI is one way of doing it. So we have programs as well within SFI, in head office in SFI, that again are, can point you in the right direction. Um, that's part of the answer. I'll hand you possibly next to maybe technology gateways. Um, it's actually quite similar in the gateways in that I'm a centre manager and, and I would have predominantly two technology strand leaders reporting to me. and They would help manage industry engagements like this. But the, the reality would be if if you contact us about an industrial engagement that we're not equipped to handle, is that we will pass you on to a centre manager in another centre or a contact in another centre. But predominantly the academic partner would manage the engagement once you found the correct partner. Uh, is there an overall person? Probably not. But if you access any centre manager in any of the, through any of the research funds, they will do their best to put you in the, right, put you in the room with the right person. I suppose as Larry probably has... Yeah, so something similar. Within Enterprise Ireland, across all the centres, there are uh, there are program managers, uh, Liam Brown or Martin Tussey, within Enterprise Ireland, would people to contact there if you wanted to get an overview of what's going on in all the centres. But the, the technology centre leaders all get together fairly uh, frequently to discuss you know, opportunities for doing joint uh, work and to learn about each other's centre. So if you were to come to say to myself and it was a specific problem that you were trying to solve and we, we, we don't cover that, we would defer you uh, to one of, of the other uh, technology centre leaders who could maybe help you solve that problem. So the, it is a very, very strong network and we, we're very good at really understanding what's going on in each other's camp. So um, I think, you know, if you do have a problem, I'd say bring it to any one of us. I think we'd be able to help uh, solve the problem. Within my own centres then, my engineering teams, if it is a problem that we can help solve uh, for you, they'll engage actively with you and then we'll engage other companies and other research organisations to get involved in, in if it's a collaborative research project that we need to do to help solve your problem. And uh, j just to echo the comments of, of, of my uh, fellow speakers, if, if you're engaging with Enterprise Island, for example, and you've secured funding, even if you haven't secured funding, you can avail of the services of what are known as commercialization specialists, for example. If you have engaged, in, if you have secured funding, you will certainly have a development advisor assigned to you from Enterprise Ireland. But, but no doubt, once you engage with anybody, uh, any of the stakeholders here that, that which have just been referenced, you will very quickly get to who you need to speak to and be aligned with, with the right technology center, yeah. Uh, we've, we've one question on um, um, Is there any place where one can find a list of Irish uh, taxpayer funded research projects that have been completed already or are ongoing so that one can avoid replicating work that has already been done? Okay, well, well I can say certainly if that person wants to talk to me, I can certainly uh, have a discussion with them uh, and we can get that information and that relevant information. We can certainly get that, yeah. Okay, um, can I ask a question? <laughs> um, uh, one for Barry Kennedy, he mentioned Factory 4. Can you explain this? This is the next generation um, of what the automated factory should look like. Um, it's, been, it's, it's a term that's been defined in Europe, we call it the Factory 4. So what is Internet of Things are connected factories. So machines will be connected to machines. Um, much more so than they've ever been before and it's about trying to define lots of things from a high level about what the standards should be, how factories could talk within the factory machine to machine, factory to factory, um, platform to platform um, and it's a whole 
list of things from the very high level architectures right down to the subcomponents within manufacturing facilities um, in terms of how factories are going to look like in the future. Okay. Um, and kind of following on from that, is there, um, is there any gaps, like this is a question for the whole panel, is there any gaps where you think um, that exist that we should be addressing? Like, I mean, if you think of like Horizon 2020 is coming up, it's just there are things that we should be kind of coordinating more on, like from an academic and industry viewpoint. Yeah, well, I don't know whether it quite addresses the, the question, but I think it's probably related to, to it, Paul. Certainly, if you, if you look at Ireland's performance under the SME call in FP7, Ireland was ranked number one per capita. We had fantastic success under FP7, uh, the SME call, and the delegate for that is, is Sean Burke and, and Jill Leonard, also as the NCP. And I understand that there's, there's equal success under Horizon 2020. So if the community are looking for opportunities into the future, and in terms of where Ireland has, has performed particularly well uh, amongst the hugely competitive uh, system that Horizon 2020 is, the SME call is a particularly good call to look at, and my understanding is that it is still a bottom-up led call, so obviously you can dictate the topic that you, you want to submit a proposal on. Um, I suppose I'd give a perspective that across the continuum because I think it, is, it depends whether you're talking in the kind of basic or the far more applied close to market end of things. I think from the early stage, early TRL areas, um, there's no doubt that there would be gaps in some areas. I think to reflect back on Horizon 2020 success, um, an area where we haven't been successful would be cyber security. That's a gap area. I think that um, as well as that, there have we, we have put out calls for centre development in advanced manufacturing in the earlier stage, mm -hmm. and there's no doubt that there's gaps mm -hmm. there in terms of kind of the overarching, I think, academic-led um, research, not not at the, the, the other end. And um, as well as that, then I'd, I'd flag agri-tech as an area where it needs to be developed as well, uh, again, in that kind of upstream kind of research, research more than development end of things. So there, there, there are three. I'll pass it back to Barry. Well, I just agree with that, but I guess the danger is when I stand here representing manufacturing and I don't talk about where's the gaps from a manufacturing point of view. Um, but if I was to say one area, that's an interesting inflection point that we believe that's, that's come upon us and, and as manufacturers in Ireland, we need to be very cognizant of, but it's the area of additive and 3D manufacturing in particular. Um, that we believe is a game changer. When you find that you can, that, that kids for a, a thousand euro can get a 3D printer and create new businesses from the back of their bedroom in the same way as the computing world revolutionized businesses and industries, we believe 3D manufacturing has that potential. And when you, it, it will change the rules of the game as these systems are now going from prototyping into full production systems in on the manufacturing floor in terms of how manufacturers look at, at their whole supply chain in terms of how to do it. And so companies in Ireland need to, if they don't know about 3D manufacturing, get to know about it and then understand what we can do with that in terms of changing the rules of the game and keep Ireland competitive and at the forefront as it has achieved over the last number of years and not lose that edge that we have. Unfortunately, Barry said exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> so I, I just want to go on record as saying he's completely right. One of, the, one of the big challenges we see is companies which have traditionally used very large equipment, have very large work in progress, et cetera, et cetera, need now to look at things like additive manufacturing and understand that they can do it locally, do it quickly, make complex parts. And it's becoming more and more cost effective. And I think at the moment there's a gap in, in where Ireland positions itself as you know, an advanced manufacturing area. There's a gap that we need to look at additive manufacturing a lot more seriously, especially with the benefit of H2020 and the possible funding that's out there. If I might just add on the AM, finishing uh, parts, I think there's a big opportunity there because the machining tolerances are going to be much tighter. There's going to be a lot less material, theoretically, to be removed. So I think there's a whole skill set there that we need to educate our companies on because we have very, very good machining companies. Okay. Hi, Robert Simpson, Dublin Institute of Technology. Uh, I'd just like to say to, to Barry that a friend of mine had cancer on the top 11 years ago and she's perfectly healthy now, so... <laughs> okay, okay, so um, yeah, uh, no repercussions at all, it was a success anyway. Uh, uh, Darren, you asked about some feedback about 
the SFI funding. I, I, as a former head of school uh, in the academic world, uh, uh, under different constraints from saving money, you know, cutting back on on, on teaching staff, you know, we're under a different, you know, it, it, there's a bit of a contradiction going on at, you know, government level in HEA and your, your side of the business, you know. And it's, you know, the more pressure you can put on, on the HEA to allow, to release, you know, academics to get into research and consultancy, all the better. That's what, that's what I would say anyway, you know. So, it, you know, I, I'm in a very well-respected, and you know, teaching institution where we're trying to encourage research and then we've got, you know, to, to deal with, you know, 18, 20 hours teaching a week and so on. So it's it's quite difficult to get good people, you know, out into into the research and consultancy area. Although there are some good ones, but to, you know, they've they've actually started some years ago, not starting in the environment. A young lecturer who might only be coming on thirty five grand a year and not seeing any prospect of a promotion or anything like that. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's yeah. just one of those things that I'm a bit worried about from that point of view. I don't want to be too negative because there's very good stuff going on there. And you want some feedback on, let's say, the survey. Uh, engineers consider themselves to be different from scientists, as we all know, and we'll go on about it. But you know, en better. I'm better. Well, no, different, different. I, I want to be politically <laughs> correct here. Um, and you know, they don't get as kick, uh, much of a kick out of, of publishing you know, research papers. Mm -hmm. They want to get a kick out of you know, successful projects or successful machines or getting their name associated with a project. You know? So it, it's hard on this SFI type of thing to do that, but I'm just wondering if there's some, you know, when you are, when you are asking those heads of school about that, you know, it might be that you know, something that might, they, they might say if they had more projects rather than more papers yeah. coming out of their yeah, department I mean, or schools, it might work that way. You know? I mean, it's a very direct piece of feedback and it's one that we have heard many times, but we want to kind of, I suppose, exercise ourselves to find a way, I'm not going to say a way around the academic um, publication side of things, but actually just to adapt depending on the thematic area we're dealing with, in this case engineering, there's no doubt that we're trying to find um, surrogate markers, I suppose, for want of a better term, that uh, equate um, the level of, we'll say, scientific academic achievement to the level of engineering, no less uh, engineering academic achievement, and we know, we know, we know they're not the same. So. Um, I can't make promises because, you know, it's difficult until, until we have kind of, I suppose, the answer to the survey to know exactly what the issue is, but we're, we're, we're doing our best. On your first point, though, I would say as well, um, I mean, we would be of a, of a mind with yourself in terms of HEA funding, very conscious of it, uh, that the block funding from HEA is, is, under, is under pressure, but that's, that's only in the R&D space. Clearly, uh, teaching time is... is um, is growing um, again because of economic austerity. This science strategy, I suppose, comes to the heart of one side of that story. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're fighting hard to get additional funding for scientific research. I say scientific loosely, STEM research, but um, we can be successful there. But if there isn't the same move on the on the education side or something something similar, we know that you're kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. So very conscious of that as well. Any more questions? Okay, well I'd like you to express your appreciation for the four speak. Sorry, could I make one last point? Because I've noticed this document here, and we none of us have mentioned it. It might be a, a kind of a solution for people as well. Uh, it's the Directory of Research Centres and Technology Centres, which is published in December of last year, far this year. Uh, it reflects, as I remember it, even though I don't know every page, implicitly research centres, technology gateways, technology centres, and then some more additional centres as well that would have been funded in previous years and are still active, but probably will be sunset in, in, or, or find alternative sources of funding in due course. Uh, I think you can get this online. You can, and we've got copies here as well. Excellent. Uh, it's a good place to start. It doesn't have all the answers, but there's probably a lot of them anyway. Okay. Well, I'd ask you again to please express your appreciation for the first speaker.